Hey, everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Widener Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1 800 303 3960. That's 1 800 303 3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Widener Show, get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give an official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Widener Show, international war ring author Mia Molson Zia. If you love fast paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. Takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is illusion and those you love will be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Zia's Gar, great reviews, and Eve Love and George by Howard celebrities, including Joanna Cassidy, Forge Riley, and Manales. So grab your copy today for Girls Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com on over 40 podcast platforms heard in 100 countries, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also, Anchor FM, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Audible, Apple Music. Also heard on HamiltonRadio.net, Diamonds FM, Oldies Radio, and a few networks coming soon. Take the Mike Widener Show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok today. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, hoodies, and also tote bags and baseball gear makes great gifts 24-7. Go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia for great books like Missing, Once, and Wrinkles, also T-shirts, merchandise, hoodies, phone cases, and more. Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia. Check it out today. I'll support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM. Hey, pal, the Mike Widener Show.com. Make sure to give generously today. We're here with a terrific lady who began her career with United in Group Army Association, a nonprofit um and work to foster a wider recognition for R&B roots and to um, help vocal groups lay a foundation for current rock and roll. We'll talk about that. She began uh, her radio career at WNWK and WNYE in New York City through uh, Ryan Italiano and later went on to WFDU and uh, with the Rim and Blues uh, roller coaster. And she's now with Hudson River Radio and Twitch and st currently streaming as well, too. And she's also the brand new owner of Studio Chatter, which is to achieve the purpose is to foster communities who enjoy live music and support as well. We'll um, talk about that live, ladies and gentlemen, from the Plus Studios somewhere on the East Coast, the amazing multi talented um, a host of. Um, the uh, studio chatter, also a uh, Hudson River Radio, Twitch, and more. Ladies and gentlemen, the multi talented Christine Vitali. Christine, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. All of that. Thank you. It's um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I, you know, I admire your interviewing technique, so I really looked forward to being able to be your interview subject today. Well, it's great to have you on board as well, too, Christine. So you began a career with uh, United in Group Harmony Associate, which is a nonprofit organization work to foster wider recognition for uh, R&B roots uh, in vocal groups, laying the foundation for uh, rock and roll and beyond. You began a radio career at WFDU, also uh, WNWK and WNYE in New York City through Ronnie Italiano. Well, we should flip that, by the way. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> also, Rhythm and Blues uh, Roller Coaster, and you're on Hudson River Radio. You stream on Twitch, and you're the owner of Studio Chatter LLC. We'll talk about that and the purpose of Studio Chatter. And before getting all that, Christine, tell us how you first got started. I got started because I was, I developed an interest in vocal groups based on actually an interest in Elvis Presley. So I was interested mm -hmm. in Elvis Presley. And then I was reading a lot about where he was getting his material from, which led me to uh, vocal groups because I, I knew he was you know, observing a lot of the material from rhythm and blues. And a lot of this is what opened the doors to my interest in vocal groups. Through that, I began, I began attending events and learned about this organization called the United in Group Harmony Association. I didn't know exactly what this was, but I knew it was a small fee to actually be a member. So I thought, okay, let me let me send in my $10 and see what it is. <laughs> and you get a little free membership and wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I, it was an annual membership that got me a newsletter every month that would talk about what's happening at a nearby venue down in uh, Union City or North Bergen near where I was living in New Jersey. And I thought, okay, this is 
interesting. They called them meeting shows. So I would go to, I attempted to go to some of these and they talked about the history of the music, a little bit about what's going on with the organization that was working to bring more um, of a spotlight to the vocal group sound of yesteryear. And they would put on a show, a number of different groups and or bands performing. And this, this, kind of fascinated me. So this was really the way I connected with the music in the live sense. After a number of um, months, because they would have a monthly meeting show, after a number of months in speaking with people and getting to know them and networking, the person running the organization was the president. He started to ask you know, kind of like, who are you? Where'd you come from? Because you're sort of <laughs> a little different than what we normally have here. You know, like I I was um, an enigma coming into this place because this organization catered mostly to people who grew up in the 50s. And a lot of it was very male dominated. It was male uh, vocal group collectors of vinyl, vinyl collectors. And here I come walking in. I'm not a record collector in the true sense. I'm not collecting vinyl. I'm not collecting vintage vinyl. And uh, I would come attend these meetings by myself uh, or meeting shows by myself because I couldn't interest any of my friends in this. They said, what is this? What is it that you do? I, you know, what, where do you go? And I, once or twice I did drag a friend in and they said, Christine, you like this? What, you know, what, what kind of a place do you like to go to here? There's nobody you could talk to or anything. And I'm thinking, you're looking for a date. I'm looking for music. There's a difference. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I don't need someone to talk to. I come here for the music. And I felt such passion to, to hear all of these classic groups, these names that were attached to um, vintage vinyl that, uh, and collector's music and group names I had never heard before. And you see, I don't want to hear music that I'm already familiar with. I want to hear music I'm not familiar with. So this was an organization that was pointing out to me music I had never heard. Um, I was only familiar with the general sound and it was an opportunity to learn a lot about this. So after a few months of attending these meeting shows, I was eventually offered a position to work for the United and Group Harmony Association in the office and to help produce these shows, these very shows that I was seeing. And with that came a responsibility of um, helping run a record store called Clifton Music and um, among some other things like booking some shows through a production company that was for profit. That was part of my responsibilities. I had the obligation of getting onto radio and that was part of the job description. You're going to be my co-host on radio. I was told. So I thought, I don't really know anything about that. And I was a little more introverted and a little bit more shy back then. Not a lot, but somewhat, but I embraced the idea of getting onto radio. So my first step was WNWK in Manhattan, where I was started out doing introductions and promotions of records that were being sold in the record store Clifton Music. So I a script was written out for me and I read the script. And then I started to engage in the conversation. So not only was I doing the recorded promotional announcements and the intro and the outro, but also now engaging in the conversation once I started to learn a little bit more about the music so I wouldn't sound you know, like a, a novice. Mm -hmm. And then I um, also joined in on the other radio program, which was underwritten by the United in Group Harmony Association. And that was really hardcore collectors, vocal group stuff. And that was on WNYE, run by New York City Board of Education. So this was a great learning experience for me to connect with people in Brooklyn who ran this station and learn a little something about New York City's Board of Education, but also get a greater in-depth um, opportunity to learn about and speak about by being an integral part of this show called Ronnie Eyes, Ronnie Italiano, Ronnie Eyes R&B Party, which really was an in-depth exploration into the roots of vocal group music. So that really fostered and fueled my interest in the vocal group sound. So between helping run the United and Group Harmony Association administratively, helping to produce shows, producing some other outside concert shows through Ronnie Eye Productions, by working in a music store where people would come in and look for collector's type material, 
And doing these radio shows, I became completely hooked and immersed in this musical realm. It was my whole entire life. And I did that for a good number of years. Then I started to feel after about five years, some degree of like, okay, I need to make some connections with the outside world because I'm living encapsulated in a world that I have no more friends in the outside world anymore. It's just mm -hmm. me living in a bubble. So I began to become a little concerned about that. So I transitioned out of that into uh, working in a university in a university capacity because I wanted to finish my education. That's something I never did. I bummed around for a good few years. It was time to finish an education. And when I came to the university, Fairleigh Dickinson University, the first thing I did was run to the university's radio station, WFDU. And yes, it's I, one of the more famous stations. I know of some people that um, you know, are on that station. It's so amazing. It had, at the time, uh, a great variety of programming of really that really opened you up to an underground subculture of music and I enjoyed being a part of that some of it was ethnic some of it was gospel um lots of blues Cajun music Zydeco and some other musical styles and I got to make a whole new set of friends there so I um I approached them and I said hey um, I, I'm new at the university and I'd love to know if you'd be interested in using me as a, a host for one of your shows, because I specialize in vocal group music. I have a, a wealth of knowledge and a good number of recordings that I have on mostly CD and vinyl, but, um, I have, I've just, I've just been released from my previous radio position and I'm available. And they said, well, that's great. And we kind of already know who you are, um, huh. but. Uh, you know, but we're not ready to change our format now, but I'll tell you what, this is what they did to hook me in. They said, we'll let you be a newscaster here. And I'm thinking, newscaster, I don't want to be a newscaster. <laughs> uh, but, I, but, you know, I know not to say no to things like I know networking is key. If you want to advance and you want to get places, you got to know people. So you got to be in front of them and around them. So I said, OK, I'll be a newscaster. Show me what to do. And they showed me how to collect news, how to rewrite it, make it a little bit more exciting and how to read it for radio. And so I was doing that on a couple of people's programs. And then some other DJs heard me doing news there and they said, can you do some news on my show? Can you do news on my show? You know, wow. why? They engage. They would engage the newscaster in a little little tidbits of conversation, like as the news started and as the news ended, the I turned it back over to the DJ who then would make a little bit of conversation with me. And they felt that that would make their shows more exciting because that's kind of like what they did on morning zoos, like mm -hmm. on new type oh, shows. Oh yeah, like Scott Shannon, Z100 back in the day, Power exactly. Pig, or like, um, or like in uh, Kiss FM Los Angeles and all that. It's like, I grew up in the morning zoo days. And I'll tell you one thing, I had like Casey in St. Louis. Of course you had, um, the loop in Chicago being I six. It's like, you know, the morning zoo was big. It's like, you never know what the heck they're going to talk about. There were no holes barred back in the day. So, <laughs> yeah. And, and so the DJs seem to like that little, you know, minute or so of exchange of dialogue about something topical, something newsworthy, or just, um, I don't know, just small talk. Sometimes it was just small talk. Sometimes it was based on a news story I gave. The news was only presented for five minutes, it, and that included traffic and weather. So they would just take a moment or two to have an exchange. I guess they felt it made their programs more interesting. So I did that for a few years, actually nine years, to be honest with you. Nine years, wow. In the it, well, I consider that my nine-year job interview because that, after nine years, since I was already on campus, it wasn't a big deal because I was already working a day job here on the very campus. So to run over to the radio station to do five minutes of news here and there was not a big deal. I would just need about 15 minutes total to put it together and then give it for five minutes. So they let me do that because that was easy to, easy enough to do, make an escape. And I started doing this on people's morning shows that started at 6 a.m. I'd be back at 9 a.m. to do another one. And then I'd come back at 11 or, or 12 in, in the day and start doing news on people's shows, whoever wanted me. 
because this was, in my mind, my way of keeping my face in front of the people who might one day offer me a show. And there I was for nine years in my nine year job interview, waiting for the opportunity for them to ask me, would you like a show? Now, they didn't ask me for nine years because they didn't have any reason to upset the apple cart. They were happy with their programming. It was making money. And when some personnel changes needed to occur, they came right to me. And the reason they came to me was because I stuck around. So if you want to find opportunity, you have to be present. Nobody's going to just take a chance on a nobody. You have, they have to, it, it's much better to build connections where you get to know people, but that means you have to pay a price. You have to be very present and not be necessarily looking for some kind of personal gain from that. It's the networking. And if I wasn't networking for that long, that was, all right, admitted, it's a long time to stick around. But since I was already here where I am right now, this was, this was a small price to pay. It wasn't like I had to go out of my way to be in their face. I was, and it was fun. I liked it. So it was my, I call it my nine year job interview because finally when they had a need to change their formatting, they did come to me and they said, would you still like to do that vocal group, vocal group show that you talked to us about a number of years ago? I said, would I? Of course not. <laughs> so I jumped at the chance. And then after a, a few years of being really good at this and, and also developing and building up some excitement, I, you know, they gave me um, more airtime. And then they also said, we'd like to offer you even the opportunity to do a second show. Nice. And so I said, so what kind of show would you like me to do? They said, well, you're really popular here. What would you like? And you see, this was a great opportunity because the popularity of my show, the Arbitron, we depended on Arbitron ratings when it was just FM, but then it began to expand to like, we were streaming from the station itself, WFDU.FM, but then it was picked up by iHeartRadio. From there, also some um, doo-wop taxi picked it up and some, certain other streaming platforms were picking it up. So this had the opportunity to exponentially um, expand my popularity, my reach. I don't want to make it sound so self-centered, just to say the reach of the music. And I developed a lot of followers, <coughs> enough so people began to offer me MC gigs where I could be an MC at concerts that were related to the vocal group scene. So mm. I work out of it. As long as I announced that I was getting an income or that I was being compensated for a live appearance, I was allowed to uh, say that. And that gave me a lot of more leverage with ticket giveaways and all sorts of things. And the internet was just coming of age back then. So it, you know, I, also was on this heavy duty campaign before they even started streaming to say, okay, I'm going to popularize my show and ha this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to be inviting guests on. I will write press releases and send them to every newspaper in the area. So I included every kind of newspaper, news journal that I can think of and other radio shows. And this did start to help me become more popular. So anytime I had a notable guest or was doing something extra special, even a feature on a particular group, I would I would send out a bunch of press releases to the news through the US mm. mail or by way of fax. Mm. I remember those days. Yes, the US mail, the fax and whatever else, the fax was supposed to be a fastest. You had those pagers, the beepers and those um, big cell phones and everything like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh and my then, gosh. And then it started to move more towards, you know, the popularity of the internet as a medium for streaming um, became more relevant, it seems, than the FM band signal. But it doesn't matter. I mean, to me, it was like, I don't care how you're listening. It's that you're listening. You know, you can listen by way of FM. You can listen on any number of streaming platforms at this point because we've expanded. And then uh, I did that for many years. I did reach a point at which when management changed, I became extremely dis disenchanted by the changes in management. And this is just the truth. I don't sugarcoat things. Mm -hmm. I grew from somewhat disenchanted to completely disgusted. And I decided to plan my exit. Mm. What, what, so, are some of the change, what were some of the changes made at the time? Um, well, the changes in management were... Um, going from somebody who had a very supportive 
uh, position who got me a bunch of swag. You were mentioning how you have your own pillow and stuff. They, um, the, the manager had gotten me a bunch of swag that I could sell and well, the monies would go to the station. They gave me a tent, a promotional tent that nice. I could take to places. And I got myself my own gigs where I could set up the tent and I could be compensated for some of these things and be promoting the station. That manager loved that. So he gave me carte blanche. All right. It, it's, it was nice to be treated with the red carpet treatment. But then he decided to retire. And so somebody else stepped up and he turned it all about him. And I don't like that. It became a very narcissistic, very self-centered driven management. And also I had gone out of my way to acquire high net worth individuals who were donating huge sums of money. And sometimes those sums of money were being matched by their employer. So that really raised my fundraising um, value. But after the management changed, they seemed to not care about that. So I felt to, at the very least, slighted, but also used, violated. I didn't feel good about this anymore. So I began to plan my exit. And uh, I had had enough. And I didn't like the narcissistic mentality of management. A good leader leads by um, encouragement and helps to develop further their staff because what helps develop staff by way of good leadership also helps the leadership. It also helps the institution. And that's what I was looking to do. I was actually raising a lot of money for the institution that I was working for, not only by virtue of a day position, but also for their radio station. Mm. I felt that that was becoming very hard to do. I was producing concerts. I created studio chatter enterprises so that I can create, produce concerts, sell tickets because I was popular now, I could sell tickets and uh, use a lot of this, what revenue that was raised to turn over to the university. And yes, mm. I did keep some of it for myself because I, er I earned it. I worked for it. The former mm. management accepted and appreciated that. The new management didn't understand this whatsoever. They were all about themselves. And they were beginning to change the format to something that they were calling uh, retro something. And I didn't want to be a part of that because it would then change what I was playing. And what I was playing, spinning, was working. Mm, I see. So the retro, you're talking like, you know, back like 60s, 70s and 80s. Did that tie into uh, what you're doing with the, um, the vocal group, the doo-wop groups that went, you know, deeper than um, the Elvis Presley back in the day or so? Well, my vocal group show was hardcore, in-depth music that was vocal groups from like, it might even be as early as the 30s. Sometimes I dipped into the 30s, but the 40s, 50s, and yeah, 60s primarily. And then sometimes some of the recordings that some groups were making that were more contemporary, but in the tradition of that, that classic vocal group sound. Hmm. Uh, so I was playing that for the group, what I called the group Harmony Alley. And I changed it to Christine Vitale's group Harmony Alley because my plan was when I leave, I'm taking this show with me. This name comes with me. You don't get to keep the name. And they, I had added another show called the Rhythm Rock and Blues Roller Coaster, which I then changed to Christine Vitale's Rhythm Rock and Blues Roller Coaster because upon my exit, I said, I'm taking this with me too. Mm. So uh, the Rhythm Rock and Blues Roller Coaster was to play anything else other than the vocal group music usually because I was moving in a direction where in order to keep producing concerts and have them be interesting to the greater public, I wanted to support the local and regional live music scene and play those artists' records. So if a band who I had a lot of respect for, like Real Musicianship, were putting out records, and I really liked their recordings, if they were recorded very organically um, and sounded like real people playing real music as opposed to computer-generated beats that I don't play. But like if, you know, people... I wanted musicians to have their music played and I gave them that forum. Mm. And then I wanted them to have a forum to perform. So I would, the, the, the way it would go in theory is, you know, musicians and bands would contact me, send me their music. If I liked it, I had to like it. I would play it. If I played it and it became popular, then I'd book that band into a concert that might have multiple groups and use this as a fundraising platform for the station for which I was working. 
mm. and then be turned over to the greater institution of the university. Mm. That's rather interesting as well, too. And we'll talk more about studio chatter and some of the in-depth groups like 30s, 40s, and 50s and more as well, too. But first, listen to the Mike Widener Show at the MikeWidenerShow.com, powered by SoundCloud Studios. Visit online at SoundCloudStudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. SoundCloud Studios is the answer. SoundCloud Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs at below the competition way. Call today, 1-800. 303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960 or email to support at soundquebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Widener Show. Get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also time to give official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Widener Show, international warring author Mia Molson Zia. If you love fast-paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon paperback and ebook. Missing is fast-paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is illusion and those you love will be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson has garnered great reviews in Eve 11 and George by Howard Celebrities, including Joanna Cassie, Forge Riley, and Minims. So grab your copy today for goals Missing by Mia Molson Zia. Available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com. Over 40 podcast platforms heard in 100 countries, including Hamilton Radio, Oldies FM, Diamonds Radio, and more. Take us with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok today. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia for great books, merchandise, and more. I'll support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, the Mike Widener Show.com. Make sure you do so today. We're here with the amazing multi talented Christine Vitale here on the Mike Widener Show and uh, began her career with the United in Group Harmony and also worked at WNW Day and <laughs> WNWK, getting tongue tied, WNYE in New York City, went to WFDU, and um, you, you've also. Uh, on Hudson River Radio as well too, and Twitch. And before we get to uh, Hudson Radio, before leading over with student chatter, you talked about uh, Elvis Presley being one of the influences as well too. You know, going deeper and deeper into the music. And uh, who are some of your other um, favorite artists and uh, performers? You know, you know, you know, especially that went really deep into the thing. It's like you know, say with Elvis going deep into you know, say like Robert Johnson, or say like with. Um, you know, the four tops going deeper into their music and maybe some of the groups that, that you really liked and, uh, you know, who are some of the other groups that influenced you way back, 30s, 40s, 50s, and, uh, and beyond as well, too, maybe in the 20s. Uh, okay. Um, I, I will tell you, I just want to first say one thing. I love your manner of how you know how to market yourself. You got that whole game down, just correct. You're very good at that. The whole merchandise thing, you're rocking the merchandise game. And I love that. And an interesting sponsor. I just want to pay you that compliment because otherwise I feel like I'm only talking about myself, which is, I know what, I'm here to do that, but I like to engage you and show some respect for what you're doing too. Okay. I, I respect your hustle. In other words, as they say, um, I respect the hustle. So anyhow, I, I admire the, your manner, your demeanor of handling your show, in other words. So let me tell you a little bit about the groups that this led me to. Um, the early roots groups, like the Dominoes, the pre-59 Drifters. I'm not talking about the Drifters that had those big hits like uh, Save the Last Dance for Me. I'm talking about what came earlier. Um, even groups like the Four Vagabonds or the Charioteers, the Mills Brothers, this is really heavy on deep roots music because I feel I can't really, I don't, when I get into something, I don't just want to appreciate the commercial hits. I dig deep. When I get interested in something and I become completely passionate about it, I dig deep. I don't stop digging. I keep digging. It's as if I'm, I'm outside in, in, in the dirt and I just keep looking and looking because I want to hear things that I don't already know. So groups like the Five Keys, the Spaniels, the Dominoes, Pre-59 Drifters, the Larks, um, mm. those are groups that I dig really deep into. Did they Were they commercially successful by and large? No. And in some cases, to some degree, yes, for their time, they were. But by today's standards, uh, that success was so minimal. But it was a different time, different, different opportunities. Uh, limited opportunities for exposure. Also, socially, uh, the world hadn't really evolved that much. So they were kind of stuck and limited to where they could get their exposure um, across racial barriers and the social times. 
of course, but to some degree, were they popular? Yes. The Clovers was one group that I haven't mentioned who recorded for a major label, Atlantic Records. The Clovers was one of the groups, along with the Cardinals and also the pre-59 Drifters, that turned Atlantic Records into a rhythm and blues giant. A lot of people think, oh, Atlantic Records, Led Zeppelin put them on the map. Led Zeppelin, that was years later. The Clovers were doing this in the early 50s. They were signed to Atlantic Records. They had 30 top 10 hits on the rhythm and blues charts. Now, rhythm and blues charts, that's a much smaller chart than the uh, billboard charts. Mm -hmm. But you got to put it in perspective of the times and with the racial barriers that existed then, the Clovers were not going to be huge on the billboard charts, but they were on the rhythm and blues charts, uh, hugely successful. 30 top 10 hits within the early 50s. That's huge. That is it huge. It is, yes. So I discover something like that, and I learned that. I say, this is a group I need to be listening to. They recorded for many years. They made many prolific recordings. Their talent was exceptional. And the more I learn stuff like this, the more I say, show me more of what I don't already know. <laughs> like, what else can I find to dig? My enthusiasm is so profound that I just want to keep digging deeper and deeper. So now I know a lot of the stuff. I don't know everything, but let's just say I know all the main groups and their material. And uh, I want to share that with people. I want to continue doing that. That's why uh, I, I did it for many years on the FM station. That's also why I took it to a place called Area 24 Radio, where I lasted a few years until they couldn't sustain their operation. They threw, they threw in the towel during the pandemic. They said it was too much. And upon my departure of Area 24 Radio, I was offered the opportunity to go on to Hudson River Radio. Yes, and, that's a really good one, too. Love to talk about that. And, 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 you know, I love the fact that it's called Hudson River Radio. I mean, the area where I live, the Hudson River is uh, such a part of our history, dating back to the Revolutionary War and probably even before. But let's just say, as far as written history goes, you know, um, George Washington spent a lot of time on the Hudson and around here and slept in many houses. And I love being in this part of the country. And this is in located up in historic Stony Point. The Hudson River is what divides New Jersey from New York City and also New York State from New York City as well. So Hudson River Radio, the station is right there on the Hudson and uh, the Hudson River, the historic Hudson River. I love the name Hudson River Radio. <laughs> that sounds fascinating. I only wish it was located by the George Washington Bridge instead of up close <laughs> to the Afghan City Bridge. It's a little out of the way. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's still in historic Stony Point. And they welcomed me there and they didn't seem to care what they didn't dictate anything about what my format would be. They said, what do you have? What do you, what can you do? What do you specialize in? What do you know? And uh, I they wanted to meet me to make sure I was quasi normal, like not not a kooky person that was mature enough to have a decent mic presence and also know something about my subject know that you have to show up and you have to show up on time. I'm not Which you do very well. I, I, I'm not perfect with it, but I'm mostly good with it. <laughs> that I, I'm reliable um, and I'm to, you know, be taken seriously. They had to make sure I was normal and not like some flaky person. Mm -hmm. And I understand my responsibility. I understand protocol. I respect authority. I like to follow rules. So my attitude is I'm happy to be here. Show me the ropes. Tell me the do's and don'ts. Tell me what you like. Tell me what you don't like. Tell me what the standard operating procedures are. And let I, my role is to fit into their organization, not make them fit mine. This is not about me as much as it is about them. Um, and it's fulfilling a purpose, I feel, that spreads this music to a, a larger audience. And then I ask, can I also do this other show called The Rhythm, Rock, and Blues Roller Coaster? And they said, well, what's that about? And I said, okay, it's about more contemporary artists who are maybe playing blues or rock-based blues or blues-based rock, rather. Um, it could be any artist whose music I like. It could be jazz influences. It could be anything. Artists send me their music and they say, can you please play it for me? Uh, I'll play it if I like it, uh, because I believe that artists who are putting out good music should have a forum for their music to be heard. 
and they seem to enjoy sending it to me and I enjoy playing it. And if they're regionally located where I could use them for my booking company, Studio Chatter Enterprises, which is a booking agency, a music booking and promotional agency, um, and also sometimes a concert production agency. I play the music. If I play the music, then hopefully that helps to popularize the artist. If I put the artist on my bill and I'm promoting them or I'm booking them into some place, it helps sell the tickets to the events because the music has been somewhat popularized. Now, this doesn't work like magic. Uh, I'm not the biggest, most important person in the whole wide world playing their music, but hey, it does have some influence and I'm doing what I can because I do find great value and tremendous rewards, spiritually gratifying to me to be serving a purpose in this world that I think is much bigger than myself. And mm -hmm. I'm very proud of that. I don't think I'm the biggest, most important person in the whole wide world. I certainly don't think it's the world according to Christine, but I do feel I was put on this earth to serve a purpose that feels important and right and valuable and that many people can benefit from. And that mm -hmm. is the value of the, the, the music establishing and furthering a music culture and an appreciation of the depths of music culture historically and what's going out there, what's going on presently with bands that um, that support the live music scene, and so that venues that book these bands can have a business where they can have live music. And because I also believe in community, and in a community, a given community like a downtown community, mm -hmm. I want venues and places to go to hear live music. My vision, my vision is one where we can have downtown local communities, just like they used to have in New York City or down in even New Orleans. Or, 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 or like plenty of parks like Central Park or say, um, you know, like in Chicago, Grant Park and uh, some other places as well, too. It's like, you know, you know, I have like little fest in Central Park, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there and everything like that. Yes. And also, though, being able to walk down a place like in New Orleans, like Bourbon Street and have live music venues, music being piped out of places it, so that there's this music scene uh, at different venues all throughout Bourbon Street, just like in Beale Street in Memphis. You want the same kind of vibe. Well, I want that in my local hometown, too. And I'm not saying that we've established that, but whatever I could do to help support the live music venues that do exist in our local hometown venue, that's my wish. It helps the artists, it helps the music, it helps the local town venues, because here's another thing. I want, I have a vision for community. This starts to branch out a little bit. When you live in a town, it's not enough to live in a zip code and occupy an address. You should be part of a community. And that means interacting and having a thriving local downtown where the shops are doing well, where the restaurants do well, and the live music all does well, where people have a chance to go to a place like a hub in a downtown community, get to know one another, support live music, support the local art scene. That's my bigger vision. And I also like this idea because it keeps people, it makes zip codes turn into neighborhoods. You develop mm. neighbors. It's not enough to live at an address in a zip code. Don't you want to live in a community? Don't you want neighbors? Don't you want neighbors who you know and could say hello to and who you could run into in the downtown local scene? So the main thoroughfare that runs through town, I love it to be bustling with the sounds of live music, with shops that are successful, with restaurants that are successful. And because it feels good, it promotes safer communities when you have an arts oriented community and you incorporate arts like even sculptures and paintings and and uh, murals into a town, it keeps neighborhoods safer. So mm. that's another, I want safer neighborhoods. I want more community oriented feels to the neighborhood. And I want I want the crime rate down. And yeah, don't want, we all, yeah. <laughs> and I want my property taxes to be a little bit more reasonable. And if my downtown is successful, it takes those commercial rateables take a lot of the pressure off the property owner. So- okay part of why I want to foster community mm -hmm. in every way. So mm -hmm. one thing leads to another with me. 
That's rather understandable, too. And I was going to ask you as well, too. You talk about having these groups you had on your shows. You had them, like, in concerts. You promote and everything. Who are some most uh, popular groups you've had on? It's like, you know, you brought back so many times and all that. And who are some most interesting groups uh, that you had on? Or maybe you can just share, like, you know, a rather bizarre story. So, like, you know, you know what one group did. Or maybe something you could just see. Sharon said, what the heck happened with that? So, you know, maybe it's some more interesting groups that you had on the show. What was basically unique about, you know, what separate from the others too? Well, what I focus on with my more contemporary artists are those developing artists, those artists that don't have iconic, legendary, or international names. So I'm not posting major, major groups, but I find artists, bands who are really interesting, that have interesting names, personalities, and put out music that I find really fascinating. So there's a group called the Slambovian Circus of Dreams. If you look <laughs> at their pictures, it looks very trippy. But if you go to their shows, the music is so diverse and it's it's rock and roll. It's rock. Sometimes you, you think you're hearing sounds of Pink Floyd. Other times you're hearing sounds of what almost sounds like punk rock coming out of this one group who has a very almost storybook like image. And more and to show you more, they come from a place called Tarrytown and. I don't know if you know anything about Tarrytown, New York, or that was the home of Washington Irving, which was America's first great writer, like first biggest writer, Washington Irving, who gave us the story of the legend of Sleepy Hollow and uh, Rip Van Winkle. And uh, they come from a very storybook place. If you ever travel to Tarrytown, you feel like you're in a fantasy world. It looks, hmm. it has a pre storybook image. And even the Tarrytown Theater, when you walk into the Tarrytown Theater, you feel like you've entered a children's storybook when you look around at the walls and the decor. It's it's almost surreal. It's almost Alice in Wonderland. Um, wow. And so this band, the Slambovian Circus of Dreams, their trippy name that sounds very much like Alice in Wonderland. Uh, yeah, or like vibe. Cheshire the Cat or the Mad Hatter and everything yes, like that. So yeah, going down the rabbit hole. I remember that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, they are very much like that. So that's one band. Now, they're very regional. They come from Tarrytown. They play mostly around New York, New York State. Sometimes they come to certain pockets within New Jersey. But right now, they're touring the UK. So even some of these local and or regional bands do get opportunities to go to the UK. But right now, things are so expensive. I'm actually worried for them that they're going to come back broke because of the cost of travel. And they did mention this at one of their shows, like with how much money it's going to cost us to get to Europe this time. We're not so sure this is a safe bet for us financially, but we're already committed to doing it and we're going to do it. So Slambovian Circus of Dreams, another group, Brother Josephus and the Love Revolution. They, huh, that's interesting. New, yes, they're from, they're from Brooklyn and they have a New Orleans based sound and a very New Orleans based image. When they take the stage, they take the stage looking like um, in, in the format of a New Orleans funeral march. So, and, and, and playing their instruments, just like if you see a funeral going through New Orleans, it's like how Brother Josephus starts off their show, Brother Josephus and the Love Revolution. So you see, that's two examples. You tuned into my show yesterday, right? Or recently. But yes, we did. I think what was it uh, last night, a couple nights yeah. ago, somewhere around there. I think yes. I've lost track. Very of the internet. <laughs> I lose track of the time too. Sorry about that. I'm I'm not good with dates. But um, recently, and I booked this band a lot too, the Slippery Chickens. I had a guest from the Slippery Chickens join my show, and uh, the Slippery Chickens. The name sounds a little naughty. It is kind of got that innuendo, but they're 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 kind of wrenchy, a little obnoxious in a nice way and people love them you go see them you get a big smile on your face they're kind <laughs> of like vintage rock and roll almost a little rockabilly kind of bluesy but it's all almost all songs that they wrote themselves not all of it there's a few covers thrown in here like they do Susie q um they do you know some of the they do a few um known songs but the bulk of their material is self-penned they put out several albums so i want to support a band like that Bands that have a somewhat original sound that are doing exciting things that take a lot of pride in what they do. They play their own musical instruments. They're not just programming stuff on a computer. Okay. And they're not auto tuning their vocals. This is. Oh yeah. Real. That's a big pain. Auto tune. I hate that. Yeah. It sounds so fake. It sounds synthetic. I like organic music performed by real musicians who 
who like to play their own instruments, who are good at what they do, they, they write songs better yet. And so I wanted to support the local live music scene. I wanted to be thriving. And so I look for bands who are doing interesting things. I want to do them a solid by playing their music. And I want to help the live music scene. I want to help them get people at their gigs. And, mm. and if I'm the one booking the gigs through Studio Chatter Enterprises, well, then that's another thing. So, uh, you know, just to, so we don't forget, I don't know if you were going to lead into this, but I started up my own Twitch channel. I call it Studio Chatter because I figure you can make money being on Twitch. Mm. If I'm making money that comes through Twitch and Twitch is going to be generating a check every time you reach a threshold of a certain dollar amount, uh, they deposit a check into my bank account. Um, I don't have the most popular stream. I'm not raking in tons of money. I see other people who do though. Boy, is it lucrative for some people. I can tell. I can just tell by people throwing money at them. Mm -hmm. uh, anyhow, every so often Twitch will make a payout and deposit it into my account. I call it Studio Chatter because that's my business. I wanted to go right into the business account. So I call it Studio Chatter. And I noticed that that name confused a lot of people. They said Studio Chatter. What's that? Studio Chatter, you know something? I think that's really something important as well, too. I'll talk a bit about that. What's coming up for uh, Christine Vitale and Studio Chatter and more. Listen to The Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com, powered by SoundWeb Studios. Visit online at soundquabstudios.com for all your needs. Also brought to you by official sponsor of The Mike Widener Show, international warring author Mia Molson's The Missing, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. We'll be back with the amazing, multi talented Christine Vitale of uh, Hudson River Radio, Twitch, and more in Studio Chatter after this time. We're back with the amazing multi-talented Christine Vitale here on the Mike Widener Show. And um, we cover a lot of ground by her amazing career going to United Group uh, Harmony Association and uh, leapfrogging over into um, Hudson River Radio, Twitch and Studio Chatter and um, a bit more about Studio Chatter. Uh, where can we find uh, Studio Chatter and where can we find you on uh, Hudson River, River Radio? Most importantly, you know, where can we locate you and uh, how can we tune you in? Okay. I'm physically, geographically located in the North Jersey area, almost close to the New York State border on the New Jersey side of the Hudson. Um, that's where I physically am. So when I book shows with my booking agent studio, my booking agency, Studio Chatter Enterprises, the shows are in this vicinity, you know, in New Jersey, sometimes in New York. And that's where the hub is of my existence. I'm on Hudson River Radio with my shows starting at 6 p.m. Eastern with The Group Harmony Alley, which is all vintage vocal groups, 6 p.m. Eastern to 8 p.m. Eastern, and then 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., I switch to the Rhythm Rock and Blues Roller Coaster, which is the format that promotes the local bands that I'd be booking, that I would be booking. You could catch the podcast on HudsonRiverRadio.com. But the station has started video streaming on Twitch now. So twitch.tv slash Hudson River Radio. At the same time, I have my own Twitch channel. That I simply call Studio Chatter since that's the name of my business. So it's twitch.tv slash Studio Chatter. Same great music that I would play on Hudson River Radio, only I call it Christine Vitale's vocal groups and other music for undeniable gratification. Oh, huh, that's very interesting. I seem to like that. And if uh, there's upcoming artists out there that want to get on and uh, how do they uh, reach you or submit the, submit the music or consideration? You can try listening to me. You can contact me on Facebook for one thing under the name of Christine Vitale. I also have a studio chatter page on Facebook, but right now Facebook locked that page up on me. I don't know why I can't access it. I need help. Nobody's been able to help me. I need help. So contact me personally. Uh, Mark yeah. Zuckerberg, please help. Yes, help, because I don't understand why I get locked out of my own groups. I didn't do anything bad. It's not like they told me, you violated our community standards. They just say, no, you got to complete these steps. And I try to complete the steps. And it says something has gone wrong. Try again. And I never get past that stage. So I really need somebody to help me. Uh, nobody ever has yet. But anyhow, I do have a website. And the website, I even struggle to keep up to date. So I will tell you what it is. It's studiochatter.com, but I don't advise you to go there and expect to find something up to date because I'm really behind on that. So, but you know, my will is to get it uh, up and running. Yeah, I don't do this full time. I still have to hold down a day job. I own a home, that's a lot of work. And you know, I'm doing a lot of things by booking bands and spending a lot of time on Hudson River Radio, doing a lot of internet 
web-based maintenance stuff and staying up to date with social media platforms and my own website, sometimes I lag on that because I look at in the scheme of things, that's probably the least important thing. But people can also email me. They can email me at studiochatterllc at gmail.com. That of all of my gazillion email addresses I've accumulated now and don't know what to do with all this stuff, that's probably the most definitive way to get to me. Studio Chatter LLC. It's a limited liability company. Studio Chatter LLC at gmail.com is probably, for the moment at least, the best way to reach me. We will certainly do so. And once again, Christine uh, Vitali here on the Mike Widener Show, uh, owner of uh, Studio Chatter LLC, also on Hudson River Radio and also Twitch and more. What else can we expect from you in 2022 and beyond, Christine? I want, uh, well, I'm hoping that I can build some greater connections for booking. I used to book in townships, municipalities, form relationships with municipalities because I'm very community oriented. And I want to form more bonds with municipalities who run summer concerts series and have those bookings again, because like I did before the pandemic, I'd like to reestablish some of those connections. It takes a lot of time and work and I have to be present. It's networking. So you got to be present. Mm -hmm. um, people don't just say, oh yeah, I don't know you from Adam, but sure, I'll, uh, start, I'll form a relationship with you where I'm going to lock you into contracts and be able to trust you. That doesn't happen that way. So I want to form more municipal arrangements where summer concert bookings that are held outdoors can be part of what Studio Chatter, once again, becomes involved in. And also meeting with groups, um, you know, organizations within different townships. So I want more township, local, municipal gigs and opportunities to get some of these bands who are very worthy into some of these municipal arenas, into summer concert series. And that's what I'm working toward. Okay. More than and if I could expand my radio reach into uh, a broader array of networks, then I'm happy to do that. As long as I know what's required of me, I need to be taught. Once I understand the technical how-to parts and I understand the protocol, my wish is to follow what serves the needs of an organization because it's not just about me. Uh, it's about who I work with as well. I mm -hmm. have an extraordinary amount of respect and consideration for the artists I work with, the stations I work with, the municipalities, the venues. I want to understand what others' needs are because I'm here to serve those needs. Mm -hmm. And very in, indeed as well, too. And uh, very, de definitely a great thing for you, Christine. And who do you consider biggest influence in your career? In my career? Yes. Career. Oh, that's that's a tough one. Uh, one of my biggest influences was Ronnie Italiano. He did definitely do a lot of groundbreaking um, teaching to me on how to run concerts how to have a good mic presence on the radio, how not to have awkward gaps and dead air and sound like you're fumbling. I'm not saying I do all of these things perfectly all the time, but I, I have the understanding of how to deliver with a strong mic presence and also how to run concerts in a very tight way, production-wise, customer service-wise. I always try to make other people feel that they are more important than I am myself. And in thinking this way, Ronnie Italiano was a huge influence. And some of my associates that I developed at the FM station, like my good friend, Tony Smith, who was also on Twitch, he has taught me so much. And even though the world doesn't necessarily know who Tony Smith is, a fair number of people seem to know who he is more than they know who I am. And I got to give credit where credit's due. So is it, is it a major name that everybody knows? No, but Tony Smith, and it sounds so generic, Tony Smith, Dot com is how you find him and you can find him on twitch as well he's got oh quite a variety of shows there so mm. um i'm giving credit where credit's due it's not necessarily this grandiose marquee name that the whole world's going to know but my influences just like my thoughts are i think very locally i try to act globally i try to be very community centered and very altruistic in my vocation to me it's very important to do work that is meaningful and to serve a purpose that is greater than myself. And I try to do it passionately with what I love and what's important to me in this world. I don't just try to do something to make money. I do things that have to be meaningful to me. 
And I feel if I do things that are meaningful, the money will be there. You don't chase the money, you chase the passion and you figure out how to develop that passion into something that you can thrive from Mm. and live. And that's a really good advice too. I like that, Christine. And what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? I, I, you know, what I do during the day is I teach students how to uh, explore careers and figure out what they want to do with their lives. I'm a career development specialist at a university. And my advice for students is find things that you can be passionate about. Find what is meaningful to you. And many times people don't have things that many things that they're interested in or are meaningful. And I say, you have to explore, leave no stone unturned. What you should do is read. If you read a lot, you will develop more interest. The more interest you develop, the more interesting you are. The more Mm -hmm. interesting you are, the more appealing you are to other people who might be in a position of hiring you. But more important than trying to be interesting is to be interested in what they're doing so that if somebody wants to hire you for a position, make sure you're serving their needs. And again, that ties back to just my frame of mind, my way of thinking, my philosophy. You are here to serve a purpose that is greater than yourself. So in each of your business arrangements, make sure you understand the purpose of who you're serving, who's working for who, and make sure you're doing something that feels meaningful and passionate. Don't just do it for the money. Do it because you love it. Mm-hmm. And make sure it's a meaningful purpose. And- and that's very good advice, too. And uh, certainly, indeed, people should do it for their own passions, not money and everything else. And that's really good advice. Once again, uh, Christine Vitale um, of um, Hudson River Radio, Twitch, and also Studio Chatter LLC here on the Mike Wagner Show. Christine, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Learned a lot from you. Looking forward to having you again soon. Make sure you keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love to have you back. We wish you all the best. Once again, tell us about your upcoming projects, what's your website, how do people contact you, where can people uh, check out your um your, your streams, check out your shows and um, check out your services. Uh, well, I, my upcoming projects might have dates attached to them. I don't know if that's okay with you. Um, okay. In, uh, but I've got the Slippery Chickens performing this Friday, August 5th, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. over at Tommy Fox's Public House, which is a local Irish pub atmosphere venue in Bergenfield, New Jersey. 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., the Slippery Chickens. They were recently my guests because, well, I love the Slippery Chickens. And and they're slippery. That's right. They don't act chicken. (laughs) It is quite an experience to witness the Slippery Chickens. So there's no charge. Come on out if you're in the North Jersey area. It's Tommy Fox's Public House, Bergenfield, New Jersey. Um, And it's a 6 p.m. show, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. So if at 9 p.m. you're still you got plenty of evening ahead of you. You can go check out another band someplace else. But I love checking out live music. I'm all about live music, really, when it comes down to it, how the live music can support many initiatives that I serve. So that's the main thing. Other than that, I am on Twitch as, as soon as possible, as many days as possible. I might try to jump on there tonight. I'm on Hudson River Radio every Sunday. And I hope to just keep building new relationships for studio chatter and also maybe more expands my um, reach on uh, radio or uh, streaming outlets. Okay, we'll certainly check you out. Once again, Christina, very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely Thanks. fantastic. Looking forward to having soon. Thanks. Make sure you keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Live have you back. We wish you all the best and you definitely have a great future ahead of you. Thank you. Take care now.